Hey, everybody, and welcome to The Brand Called You. So listen, about a month ago, a friend of mine called me and told me she had scored a couple of tickets to the Vermeer show in Amsterdam. This was like the biggest show about Vermeer at the Rijksmuseum. And she was so excited. She was like jumping on a plane and just going for the weekend. So when she got back, I, I said to her, you know, so so what else did you see? You had three days. She said, well, I went there. And of course, I, I went to the Anne Frank house. You know, as in the house that Anne Frank and her family hid in during the Holocaust until they eventually were taken away and all but the father were murdered. And it occurred to me that like for most people that uh, Jewish history in the Netherlands begins and ends with Anne Frank, like that's it with death and destruction. And I wanted to tell her, you know, if she'd only walked a few hundred yards, a few hundred meters down the road, she would have ended up chanting upon the most beautiful Sephardic synagogue, um, a lit with a rainbow of candles only, no electricity that still stands today and is such a reminder of what Judaism used to be in the 17th century and beyond in the Netherlands. Um, it's, it's unfortunate that, you know, in a way, so many of us don't know about this rich Jewish history in the Netherlands. And that's why I'm so excited to have my guests here today. Um, I have um, two, two wonderful scholars who wrote a fascinating book called A Jews in the Netherlands, A Short History. Tirza Levy Bernfeld is an independent scholar who specializes in cultural aspects of the Portuguese Jewish community of the early modern period. And she's a National Jewish Book Award winner and the author of Poverty and Welfare Among the Portuguese Jews of Early Modern Amsterdam. Bart Wallet is also a professor. He's an early modern and modern Jewish history professor at the University of Amsterdam. And he's published extensively on the history of Dutch Jewry. And he's also the editor of the European Journal of Jewish Studies. So welcome both of you. Thank if you. you. I, I really Thank want to you. congratulate you. I know that your book is originally published in Dutch, but has been translated in English. Um, my Dutch is not good enough to have read it in, in its original language, but I enjoyed it so much. And I, I must say, like, even though I love history, I found that the way you wrote it, you you wrote it in small little sound bites, many little, very, very easily digestible chapters made it so accessible to, to those of us who are not historians or academics. Um, and I'm really curious, uh, what drove you guys to feel the need to write this book? Uh, maybe we can start with you, Tirza. Well, I'm not sure we, we felt the need, but it, we were requested, we were asked to, to okay. write it. And uh, because I think uh, Bart might uh, correct me that we did a certain survey on 400 years of the history of the Jews in Amsterdam and that was published and it was such a success that we, um, that we were asked to, um, to write another book, but then on the history of the Jews in the Netherlands, and then in short stories, so in short, short chapters. Yeah. yeah. And um, I'm not sure whether, but we, 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 we came to the conclusion that this would be a nice way, and with the pictures especially, and to, to comprise it to, to small, small pieces of, uh, of histories and stories so that people could easily uh, get to know and get an impression of Dutch Jewish history. Well, well, I picked out a few a few chapters that I that okay. fascinated me. I mean, the first thing is I didn't realize that the Jews came as early as the twelve hundreds. Is that correct? The yeah, but they didn't. You shouldn't see it as a continuing history. They came and they went, and then they came again. So it 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 started like thirteenth century, fourteenth century, and then they. They moved out again, and then it was only in the 17th and end of the 16th century that they continued, that they started again and settled down. Right. And and I guess um, I, I always wondered why it seems like every city or many, many cities have a Jodenstraat, a Jewstraat. Why did they always feel, why was there the need to separate or call attention to a street where Jews lived? I mean, was that part of the the, rule, the laws you talked about, the medieval concept in which, in which ethnic minorities were, were, were regulated? Is that? I'm not sure. Um, that, that just uh, happened to be. It was also not in every, every but, but people got to know that the Jews were, where, wherever the Jews were living, then they, they made that street uh, name. They named that street after the the the, the area in which they lived. So uh, I think it wasn't imposed on the 
okay. outside world, but um, it was part of the atmosphere that that it was so being emerged, done. So it emerged right. organically, not for sinister reasons. For yeah, right, right. Because no, no, that I don't yeah. think so. No. Yeah. So, so everybody, everybody has heard about the golden age, right? But right. I guess I would love to hear Bart. Maybe you can explain to me. I always wondered, like, what were the forces that made it possible to suddenly, um, you know, welcome Jews? I, was it the end of the war with Spain? Was it the, was it, I, I'm very curious what, maybe you can. Well, the, the, the irony is the Netherlands didn't welcome the Jews. Um, <laughs> they, they found themselves to, to have suddenly a Jewish community in uh, some of the cities in the Netherlands. And the reason is that, um, of course, in, in the beginning of the 17th century, um, the, the Dutch Republic is economically very successful. So there's a lot of work um, uh, and it's, it's a trade center uh, um, in itself. Um, and, uh, and, and this this... The, this causes that uh, Portuguese merchants um, who are very heavily involved in colonial trade, they think like we should be in this new economic center. We should move part of our uh, uh, our firms to, to Amsterdam. So they, they send family members to Amsterdam. Um, and originally when, when they came, they were Catholics. Um, so these were Catholics accepted into the cities of Amsterdam. Um, let me just but, stop, let me just stop you for a minute. Catholics, because they were forced to convert earlier on in Portugal. Uh, yes, so it, it it appears that most of them uh, actually were of Jewish ancestry. Uh, so their families had converted to Catholicism one hundred years before that, um, and gradually in the Netherlands they decided to um, to become Jewish again, um, and they they found it. A, a new Jewish community, and of course, that caused like the the, the municipal authorities to to think like, what's what's happening here? We thought like there were Catholics settling here, but suddenly we have a Jewish community, and do we have any policies uh, about having having Jews at all? Um, and then you see like some cities in the Netherlands are not that tolerant. They say we don't want to have. Jews, eh? for instance, the city of Utrecht, um, uh, cities of Deventer or Tilburg, they uh, they didn't allow Jews to settle in. But other cities like Amsterdam and Rotterdam and uh, The Hague, they welcomed uh, uh, Jewish communities. And uh, there were a few rules and regulations, uh, but in general, they they thought like these new like Portuguese Christians turned into um, new Jews. And we're a welcome addition to um, to to the to the landscape of the cities and bringing new businesses and economic ties to the rest of the world. So, so was primarily at that time the businesses were like was it the silk trade? Was it what were some of the what were some of the primary businesses at the time? Um, well, a, a lot of colonial trade. So uh, sugar, for instance, um, uh, that was uh, like one of the, the delicacies that was brought from the colonies to um, to, to Europe. Um, um, but uh, uh, also um, other commodities, uh, colonial commodities, um, uh, diamonds, uh, uh, of course, um, uh, were also brought from, from Brazil, for instance. Um, and so there was like a, a whole yeah, new aspects of, of trade that the Netherlands didn't have before yeah, were, were brought in uh, and introduced by these new uh, Jewish communities in the country. Including slavery? Um, yeah, well, the, 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 there was a law in the Netherlands that, that banned slavery in the Netherlands itself. But in the Dutch colonies, there was definitely slave, slavery uh, going on. And um, in that sense, there was not a difference between Christians and Jews. Uh, um, uh, if you were of a, of a certain like uh, position in society, you had slaves and uh, uh, Jews had slaves just as Christians had slaves. And, and some of them brought uh, their slaves uh, to the Netherlands as well. Technically, then they were no longer slaves, but they were servants. Um, yeah, although we, we we don't know exactly like if, if they realized in all cases that they technically were free and um, uh, yeah, so uh, it, 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 um, one of the, the fascinating aspects is that in the same neighborhood where 
the, the Jewish community started in the Netherlands. It's, it's the same neighborhood uh, where as well the black community in the Netherlands uh, started. And these are intertwined histories. Interesting. So uh, intertwined in that um, they, the slave aspect of it? Um, no, the, the, they, they worked together. I mean, they worked they were employed by the Portuguese or they uh, were taken by the Portuguese to work or to I see. So they uh, were their lives were intertwined in that respect. Uh, is uh, you, your specialty of course is is the the poor and, and this very it's very interesting to me because at around the same time you're talking about life in the Netherlands, life I know in New York, for example, um the one caveat that both Peter Stuyvesant had a prior one, it was still New Amsterdam and then later when the British had New York was that the Jews had to be able to take care of their poor. Um, and I wondered if the same was true during this this time uh, in-, in, oh, in yeah, yeah, no, yeah, that they were, I mean, as Pat explained that, um, that, you know, the Republic and the city of Amsterdam and the, the, the states of Holland and West Friesland, they, they were wondering what to do with the Jews. So, I mean, suddenly there are Jews in the country, we have to deal with it. One of the conditions they, they said, but poverty, the poor, you, they have to take care of themselves. They have to take care of the poor themselves. So the, the Jews, so that was one of the things that um, being uh, aware of their situation and it was, wasn't was just already a stable, settled situation for the Jews. They knew they have to build up a good welfare network and the welfare system so the poor wouldn't go begging in the streets, the Jewish poor, and wouldn't go to ask for money at the churches or go and ask for money at, uh, at, the, at the city uh, authorities. So that's why they build a, a very strong system of welfare. On the other hand, there were so many restrictions for Jews that employment, find employment was another problem. So in the end, they already in the 17th century, also the 18th century, they tried to to get the poor out of the city. I mean, it was very attractive. The Portuguese community had a reputation of welfare and benevolence. And uh, so people, can, I mean, Jews came from everywhere. And um, we have lists of, of, of people being Jews getting some money from the community and being send out or back home or well, you, continuing you, elsewhere. You had a chapter that absolutely was new to me about something called the Suriname Project. Was that, yeah, maybe you can, yes. one, either of you could. <clears throat> no, that it was one, okay. So during the 17th and 18th century, the, the Portuguese community tried to get their poor into uh, to two overseas colonies or back home, as I just said. And, uh, but it didn't really work. There were too many stayed there. The economy was getting worse. The income, the taxes, all the uh, all, all went down the drain. And so they decided to set up a colony. Um, uh, Suriname was already a colony and the plantations were there, but to put one third of the poor, put them, take them out of Amsterdam and have them work in the in the colonies and especially in Suriname. So there was one project. It didn't succeed, no. but uh, but it was planned well. And it wasn't only because to get rid of the poor, but they didn't know what to do with them in the city itself. There was no employ, not enough employment for that. Well, so what were some of the solutions that helped integrate the poor? Were well, there the solutions were to integrate. Well, if if you didn't have money to 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 make a living what 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 to integrate there was so much they they could help them help the poor to a certain extent but it was impossible to to there were one third of the of the community was paying taxes to keep two third of the people on welfare it was a completely unhealthy financial system something had to be thought about and, and executed and the Suriname project was one of the plans and one of the projects uh, was it was the same um, rules imposed upon the Calvinist community, for example, where they also they had, but not into that extent. 
they oh. had but they were they, but they had they could work in the guilds they could you know they were not they didn't have restrictions on their uh, on the on the work uh, possible of the options of work and and that and there were restrictions for the jews that was the problem they they had to deal with their economy was not healthy Right. So now you you had some wild characters in your book, like this guy Sabatai Zavi, the Sabatai. mystic. Can you tell me this is a mystic <clears throat> one who rides into town and convinces everybody he's the Messiah? Um, no, well, there was not only in Amsterdam. He 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 traveled through Europe and masses of Jews everywhere, Ashkenazi and Sephardim, were very excited that the Messiah had come, until he turned to, to uh, until he converted to the Islam and the whole Jewish world was upside down. But there were Jews in Amsterdam who took already the boat, sold their business, took the boat. They 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 came to to Italy and then it turned out that he, you know, this was a big disappointment. So Shabbatai Tzvi as a false messiah was not only a phenomenon that, that, that hit the Amsterdam, both Ashkenazi and Sephardi community, it was an uh, it it struck communities, Jewish communities all over the world. Yeah, you know, it's hard to imagine yearning for a Messiah today in the same extent, unless you're very religious, because we, we live such rich lives. But I imagine with such poverty and despair that a Messiah would have been something you would have really yearned for. Um, but I, I know about charismatic leaders because um, uh, we certainly are experiencing them all over the, the globe right now. Um, I, I wondered about how how the effect that Islam had on, I, I guess my, maybe it's not Islam, maybe it's Catholicism, but I've been out to Outer Kerk, to the Jewish cemetery, and, and they're, they're, the gravestones are very un-Jewish, like they're filled with mm -hmm. graven images. And it, what influence was that? Um, I mean, were they influenced by Catholic Islam? Influence. Oh, Catholic. Catholic influence, Catholic influence. And the rabbis let them go in to a certain extent. There's even an image of God on a on a on a tombstone. Um, but they let them go the the, the rabbinic leadership because otherwise they would uh, lose them as as members. But uh, that's a very Catholic uh, influence, and and also from the Dutch uh, um, Dutch environment. But images on the that there are images on on stones is very un-Jewish. You are right, but that's um, that's because of their Catholic background, as Bart uh, just mentioned. Uh, you know, they I, were, they, yeah, they were very proud, and they said, like, in a way, they were new Jews uh, in in the sense not only that they they came back to Judaism, but they invented as well a new type of Judaism, which they yeah. themselves even called Bom Judesmo. Hey, like we are the good, the civilized uh, uh, Jews. Um, and of course, they differentiated themselves from the Ashkenazim, the other Jewish community in the town um, hey, that were not that civilized. And uh, so all their like this, this, this wealth and uh, and beautiful music, for instance, as well in the synagogue services, um, uh, the, the tombstones, hey, it, it all, it's all part of this bomb Judesmo to, to demonstrate that they have a civilized uh, version of, of Judaism. And and then the Sephardi, the uh, sorry, the Ashkenazic Jews from Eastern Europe came in around what time was the big influx? A, a bit later, um, uh, but the, maybe 10, 20 years later than the, the, the Portuguese uh, Jews. Um, uh, and initially, uh, they, they were employed by the, by the Portuguese Jews, um, uh, but because they were, uh, most of them, very poor, and this was bad for the image of the Portuguese community. Uh, so already in 1639, uh, the, uh, the, the Portuguese community in, in, like forces the Ashkenazim to become an independent uh, community. Um, yeah. Now, in the 18th century, uh, this community is growing so rapidly that it becomes the uh, the largest of all of Europe uh, in the 18th century. Uh, so um, migration, especially of Ashkenazi Jews from the German countries, from Eastern Europe, uh, continues throughout the century, uh, uh, developing uh, the city into the largest Jewish community. I mean, I, I hate to skip ahead a few, a few centuries, but uh, since we are limited on time, I mean, I have to move ahead to the very history I started with. Um, uh, the Dutch 
arguably lost, I think they had maybe the highest per capita death rate in Western Europe of any country during the Holocaust. And you have a, a very poignant chapter about the Dutch Jewish Council, which many people might not know about. Um, maybe you guys could just share with us what why they were so, what they were and why they were so provocative. Well, the, the Jewish Council was, in a way, you could say the, the government of the Jewish population in the Netherlands uh, during the war period. Um, and Jews were isolated from the rest of, of Dutch society. Uh, they were no longer allowed, for instance, to go to uh, to regular public schools. Um, uh, in, um, uh, in a lot of jobs, they were not, no longer uh, allowed to function. And so the idea was that uh, the Jews had their own um, community uh, headed by the Jewish Council. Uh, so the Jewish Council had to take care for education, for health care, for, uh, for everything, uh, basically. Um, now, um, and this was part of the, the Nazi agenda of isolating the Jewish community um, uh, in order to uh, thereafter uh, more smoothly uh, deportate uh, them uh, to the concentration camps uh, in, in, the, in the East. Uh, and now there's, there's a huge um, a debate on uh, the question like, um, was the um, the Jewish Council, um, and like the leaders of the Jewish Council said, like, we, we, we are doing this yeah, in order to protect our communities as much as possible. Um, uh, uh, but they in, in the meantime, they had to cooperate with the with the Nazis, um, uh, which uh, caused others to say, like, you are basically collaborating uh, with the, the Nazis and uh, executing part of their uh, of their work. So it's a co very controversial topic. Uh, up until today, basically, in, in the Dutch Jewish community. It's it's controversial, but I always wonder if, you know, how much of this sort of rule-based Dutch culture that the Jews absorbed and, you know, they behaved according to their cultural norms. Um, oh, absolutely. Dutch Jews were very Dutch in that Dutch. sense. Yeah, um, yeah uh, <clears throat> they trusted uh, um, uh, authorities, uh, and they hadn't experienced, uh, um, like, anti-Semitic outbursts of violence uh, since the, the, the beginning of the settlement in the Netherlands. Eh? So for hundreds of years, of course, there, there was anti-Semitism, eh? uh, but never in uh, in, the, in a violent way as as in, in Germany or in Eastern Europe uh, was, was the case. So they felt very much at home. They felt very, very Dutch. Uh, they, um, uh, and, and in, in a way, uh, that that is part of the so-called Dutch paradox. How is it possible that such a well-integrated community uh, is is one of the severest hit communities in uh, in all of Europe? Um, and and part of uh, part of it is uh, the, the the nature of the society, the the the, the bureaucracy, the well-functioning bureaucracy, and the trust people had in the bureaucracy. And 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 uh, and willingness to, to to play by the rules. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, maybe I, I know this, the book, the book references some of the things that came out of the Holocaust, some of the social service agencies like the NEV and so forth. But um, I guess I would love to ask you about the trauma aspect. Um, how did that reshape or how will it reshape as you know, you're, you're, you're both historians, but looking forward, um, how does trauma um, reshape a culture? I mean, it's a very broad question, I know, but I would love to just get a few ideas that you have about what you, th how you think it might have reshaped Jew Jewish life in the Netherlands. How it might have? Inter intergenerational or... trauma and, and its effect on Judaism moving forward. I mean, I have my own ideas, um, having lived in the Netherlands. Um, I mean, for me, I, I've, I've, you know, being being so uh, living there, maybe what forty or fifty years after the Holocaust, which is a relatively short time, um, I could see already a fear of outside ideas, a fear of of the innovations that you would see in America, Jewish innovations, um, like um, new ideas, uh, reconstructionist Judaism, while integrating orthodoxy and liberalism, and this this kind of way of um, moving forward <clears throat> with new ideas. I well at the yeah. time limited yeah yeah well as a dutch jew myself i i feel in holland that trauma is still too much uh, being um yeah is living on in the lives of the dutch jews yeah. and uh 
myself, I'm that is what bothers me that people talk about their identity and formulate their position as a Jew on basis of what happened to you or your family in the Second World War. Myself, I would like to, I know that Judaism has much more to offer, yeah. um, that we should go beyond this stage of trauma and, um, and that we should, you know, renew and go ahead. And as you say, what is going on in America, maybe, or in other Jewish communities, I think in Holland, we're too much stuck and too much concentrated on 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 the past on the past in on the i mean on the holocaust i should say not that yeah. so for me it's it's very important not only to go beyond the holocaust and and study the the more positive things of jewish what jewish history in the netherlands has offered is offering us but also to go ahead and go beyond this trauma and 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 uh, look for an positive Jewish life, uh, even if it's not in Holland and, and somewhere else. To celebrate the, the joys and not the oys of Judaism. Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> I, think, I think you're talking about using the Holocaust as a, as a seeing eye dog. Um, and some of yeah. it I think is, you know, they even, they even know now that the children, almost every Jew in the Netherlands is a child or a grandchild of a Holocaust. All right, of course. And, yeah. and the epigenetics are such that already it's in our, it's in our genes, you know, and, and it's going to take a very big concerted effort to change from, to change. But I think your book, I think your book is a, is a great first step because primarily it, to me, what came out of it was just the, the miraculous way that Jews, when, when no one else in the world was doing it, you know, welcoming Jews and, uh, celebrating kind of this incredibly impressive history, um, mm -hmm. and it, and it and it and it kind of makes the Holocaust a footnote, but not the spotlight. Not not the main thing. All right. Yeah. That that's what was my purpose, at least. I think also Barb's. I think yeah. you. 100, I think you one hundred percent succeeded. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you very much. Yeah, um, Bart. But what about you? How do you feel about trauma moving forward? Well, th th there is a debate uh, in in the young generation of of Dutch Jews, and uh, and we invited several of them at the presentation of this this book uh, to comment on on the book and to to uh, reflect on uh, on the book and to see like what chapters especially challenge them, um, and uh, and th there is a debate in in this young generation uh, to what degree they want th themselves to be called the third or the fourth generation right. uh, the fourth generation and i know uh, like, like there are we say like yes we are the third generation and we are still like carrying the trauma but i also know of of young dutch jews who refuse to call themselves any longer the third generation because mm -hmm. they say uh, that their Jewish identity should be a positive one. Uh, and of course, there is the, the, the war, um, but it doesn't define their Jewish identity mm -hmm. yeah. uh, anymore. anymore. That, that's a, yeah. that's I, I very important. Thought, I always thought 60 years was the shelf life on, on, on trauma because I remember... Um, about 60 years after the war, my mother, who would never even let me buy a, she's, my mother's a Holocaust survivor. She would never let me buy a Germ German hairbrush as a kid. She suddenly called me and said, I bought a new car. Do you want to ride? I said, yes. And she put up in a Volkswagen. And I, said, I said, you got over the war and you didn't tell me? She said, it was on sale. <laughs> so, you know, maybe that's it. Maybe we can start. But I can't thank you both enough. Um, I, I hope everybody will read will read your book and we'll have a link, of course, to it on the website. And I wish you continued success with, with all your research and writing. Thank, Thank, you. You, so Thank you very much. Thank you. You. Bye bye. It was great. Bye. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.